What a wonderful song to uh, begin our time in God's Word with, because really at the foundation of everything is that blessed assurance of our faith in Christ as we live it out in this world, because there's really no guarantee in this world except the fact that if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are going to heaven. Wherever the trip ends. And who knows how that's going to happen. So this morning as we open God's Word, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, which we have been going through verse by verse through this whole book. We've been seeing the, the wonderful position of the, the believer in verses 1 through 3, and then we've seen the practice of the believer, a spirit-filled believer in verses 4 through 6, and then Paul ends this entire time by saying, okay, this is who you are. This is how you're to live, and it's not going to be easy because you have a personal enemy out there who would seek to undo you. Let's read verses 10 through 17. It says, He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. In other words, this is a battle you can't fight on your own. Put on the full armor of God, not just any old thing you can come up with, but the armor of God that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes, the methodias, the methods of the devil. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the people of this world. We're to win them to Christ, not kill them as in ages past. Some things that were associated with Christianity, like the Crusades and all that stuff, which really wasn't true Christianity, but they went out and killed for the name of Christ. That's not our battle. It's not against flesh and blood. Our battles against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places is therefore take up the full armor of God. This is a spiritual battle. This isn't a political battle. This isn't a psychological, social battle. It's a spiritual battle. And the enemy is way more powerful than we are. So get on the armor of God, he says, that having done everything, that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. At the end of the day, you're still standing. You're still in the battle. You're not knocked down. You're not drugged down. You're not taken out. He says, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you're able to distinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. May God bless the reading of His Word, and as we study it, may He open our eyes and our hearts. Now in previous studies, we've seen many things. We've seen that we as Christians are involved in a deadly battle with a deadly spiritual supernatural enemy who is bent on destroying our lives and he holds back nothing from us that this world can throw our way. He has a mighty quiver of fiery darts and arrows which we'll be talking about this morning. You know, last week from Romans chapter 8, we saw some of those wiles, some of those methods, uh, some of those arrows that Satan points at us and Paul mentions them in Romans chapter 8. He says, there will be tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, and sword. And many Christians throughout our world are actually experiencing those very things. We think we're being persecuted in this world when in reality we really haven't been experiencing much of anything in the United States. Let me read you an article from a World Magazine about what's happening in northeastern Nigeria. It says, on the Sunday morning, Boko Haram, which means no Western education, I, I don't know what language that is, but that's what it means, and nothing to do with the West. Boko Haram militants attacked the town of Mchika in northeastern Nigeria. Pastor Joel Billy gathered the children of his congregation to the front of the church. Fears were thick as rumors swirled the jihadists might arrive any day. Some trans people had fled, but others stayed, realizing they had few options to a safe haven in the rugged terrain nearby. On a Sunday morning last September, hundreds of Christians gathered to worship at Billy's Church, a congregation of the Church of the Brethren in Nigeria. 
The pastor walked down the platform steps, laid his hands on the children's heads, and delivered a harrowing message. It is the plan of Boko Haram to come and drive us from our homes, from our churches, he, he remembers telling the little ones. If they do come here, he said, never deny Jesus. If, if they kill your parents, never deny Jesus. If they take you away to the Sambisa forest, never deny Jesus Christ. Well, anyway, they came that day. The pastor heard gunshots, urged his congregation to leave the church quickly. Large gatherings of Christians are prime targets for Boko Haram, and one of the reasons the militants often attack on Sundays. Most members carried only their Bibles and some used hymn books as shields against flying bullets. He says, some were shot, including an associate pastor. At least 40 church members died in the onslaught. The pastor pastor says the rest scampered into the surrounding wilderness as militants advanced. We fled from the altar to the bush. Boko Haram held the town for the next five months. You know, in Romans chapter 8, Paul mentions tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, and sword. And that's a reality in much of the world. But you know, he also assured us And that's why we sang Blessed Assurance in Romans 8.37 that in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer. He uses the Greek word hupernike, hyper-conquerors. We're super-conquerors, he says. We're, We're those who overcome. How? Well, through Him who loves us. Through Christ. And since we're in Christ, neither life nor death, he says, neither demonic ranks or powers, neither things present nor things to come upon this world, and nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God which we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Pastor Billy's words ring true. Never deny Jesus because it's not worth it. I don't care what the temptation is. Here in America, we have temptations of materialism and drunkenness and indulgence and whatever you know, vain philosophies, the idiotic philosophies of man, you know, professing to wise, they became morons, Romans one twenty one, and we have all those kind of things. We don't really face physical persecution where they're going to kill you. We may have that someday, but the truth is, never deny Jesus because it's never worth it. Because the eternal outcome of your soul, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Absolutely nothing. There will be a man someday who will reign with absolute power for seven years and he ends up being the first occupant of hell. The Antichrist. Was it worth it? Not for him. Not for anybody. It's the assurance of faith that we face the enemy in the battle that is daily set before us that in the evil day, verse 13 says, clothed in the armor of God, having done everything, we are still standing firm, facing the enemy. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning, the issue of faith. Look at verse 16 again. He says, in addition to all, and what, what he's actually saying is, in, in addition to the girdle of truth, the, the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to that, taking up the shield of faith. And the idea is, when you're going to engage the enemy, you take the shield and, and you march off to war. He says, with which you're able to extinguish all, underline that in their Bible, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, a fourth piece of the armor I'm to take up is the shield of faith. And this isn't necessarily that body of truth that defines the Christian faith, a la Jude chapter 3, but I believe it has more to do with the exercise of our faith and the living out of our faith in the daily battle. Because that's the context of the passage. Although the two are really inseparable. Sound doctrine, when put into practice, produces godly living. God's Word, when listened to and applied, produces a godly life, doesn't it? Because the doctrine is always the foundation. Belief in the right person and the right things is always why we come out as victors, as overcomers. But this verse indicates that this is the faith exercised in the heat of the battle. 
as we lift our shield to protect ourselves from the fiery darts or arrows or missiles of the evil one. Note that again in your Bible, the evil one. So first of all, notice this is a personal attack. Okay, it's the evil one. First Peter 5 8, your adversary, the devil. There's somebody out there who wants to destroy your life. And he's not just messing around, he is a deadly, ruthless enemy. These are the schemes, the flaming arrows of the devil. Our struggle, verse 12, is against rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, and spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. In other words, Satan and his demons are making war on you, the church. We are his personal targets. That's why the church is not faring so well. We're not standing in the battle. We don't have our armor on for the most part. Now, how do we conduct this battle? Well, So far, we've been commanded twice in verses 11 and 13 to put on the full armor of God. And so far, we've looked at three pieces of that armor that we are to put on and never take off. We're to be girded with truth. And we said the the Roman soldier had a tunic on. It was kind of, you know, like a robe. And and when he would prepare to go into battle, he would have this, this girdle of this large leather belt, and he would tuck all the loose ends of his, of his tunic into that, and then he would put on his armor. And we're to be girded with truth. Truth is to be that which holds our lives together. The Word of God is what holds our lives together when practiced. And then we're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, that's the living out of the Word of God. That was that piece of armor that was shaped to the, to the soldier's uh, body, and it covered the front and the back, and it was a solid piece of armor. And the arms were open and so on and so forth. Sometimes he'd wear chain mail underneath, uh, underneath that and he'd be fairly protected in the battle. But the breastplate of righteousness protects the heart and the emotions, right? This is the heart and the emotions. The heart was analogous to the thinking in ancient, the ancient world and, and the emotions to the bowels, this area. You didn't want to get cut on or stabbed in either of those areas. And then we're to, we saw last week we're to shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And, and that wasn't just spreading the gospel, but the fact that we stand in the gospel of peace. We have peace with God. He's on our side. Therefore, we can stand in the battle in that confidence. We don't go out and wonder, oh, I wonder if God's going to protect me. Oh, I wonder if God's going to get me through this. Well, through life or death, Romans 8 says, He will cause you to be a super conqueror. The cessation of life only translates you into heaven, right? So don't deny Jesus just to eke out a little more existence on this wretched, wicked world. That's what Pastor Billy told his congregation and his words rang true. I would encourage you to get the CDs or uh, go online and listen to those messages over and over again. You'll be eternal gratefully. You'll be eternally grateful that you did if i seem to be having a little problem communicating did i had a root canal and a colonoscopy this week so i'm a i'm a little i'm a little frayed at the uh, edges so uh, i just want to tell you that it's uh, it, ha- it hasn't been a great week for me although uh, it was great to be here for the for most of the uh, dvbs uh, daily vacation bible school and just see the great time and all the kids that turned out. We had like 70-some kids and Craig and, and Denise did a great job and all the others who helped organize that thing and just t- tons of people. But I was feeling a little afraid. So anyway, listen to those messages. You'll be eternally grateful that you did. But this morning, as I said, I, I want to consider the shield of faith. So what's Paul talking about here? Listen to how one commentator described this wonderful piece of armor in the uh, Roman soldier's repertoire. He said the shield indicated here in distinction to that small round shield. Remember, in most battles you see on TV or something, they have that little, looks like a giant frisbee, you know, like since we're talking about marvelous Marvel characters, Captain America, you know that thing he throws like a frisbee and cuts people in half and all that stuff? Anyway, it was kind of a shield like that, and you'd use it in combat, and you'd hit people, and 
and beat them up and stab them and all that kind of stuff. This is not that shield. But what he's talking about here is a large shield about four feet high. It was about this high and two, two and a half feet wide, very much like a door. In fact, the, the word is actually taken from uh, uh, the word for door in the Greek. It must have been the kind of shield, as he says, the Spartan mother had in mind when she charged her son, take care that you return with your shield or on it. It's probably big enough to carry a body. This shield would either be his protection, or it would be his downfall. It would be his buyer, his uh, funeral pyre, whatever. And it's the same with us, isn't it? Either the shield of faith can be our protection, or it can be our undoing. It can cause us to get pierced and wounded and We can't really die in the battle because Christ won us life and He is the way, the truth, and the life. But we can get destroyed in the battle in a worldly sense. Anyway, he went on to say the Roman scutum or shield, or this is actually called the thurion, was made of two layers of laminated wood covered first with linen and then with hide and then bound top and bottom with iron, with an iron ornament decorated on the front of it. A man could put his entire body behind it as it absorbed the javelins and arrows of the enemy. In the case of flaming arrows, which we're talking about here, very often the arrow would snuff out as it buried itself in the thickness of the shield. During battle, these great shields would often bristle with smoking arrows like roasted porcupines. (laughs) That's quite descriptive, right? See the porcupine quills and, you know, they're on fire. Same thing here. Soldiers would, what would happen, the Roman army would send these soldiers, they would be up front and there would be a troop behind them holding the shield over their head and people would be underneath them and they would be going as a wedge into the the, uh, opposing army, dividing and then the shields would drop and they would divide and conquer. That's where that... That saying actually came from. So, Now here's the picture for the Christian. As we move forward for Christ like a wall of Roman soldiers in battle, as the phalanx moves forward, the enemy is constantly launching fiery arrows of temptation and lust, of deception and false teaching, of ravenous wolves from without and false brethren from within. And unless we have our shield up, our shield of faith up and in place, we're going to get burned. We're going to get pierced and discouraged in the battle. And though the victory has been won at the cross because of this personal enemy, you and I as Christians can live defeated and distressed lives, depressed lives, lives that are nowhere near what God describes for us in the Scripture. You know, we can live a whole life as a Christian robbed of our joy, right? Right? Because we're so inundated and so buried in the the garbage of this world and the sin of this world, or we can uh, lose our strength in Christ. We can't do all things through Christ who strengthens us because we're not walking with Christ. We're not trusting Christ. We're not really believing His Word and walking with Him. So we can get robbed of the life that God really has for us. And I don't know about you, but I want to be that man. I want to live that life that God describes for me in the Scriptures, don't you? And that's a life of faith. But if I don't take up the shield of faith, and I'm not putting it to its proper use, then that life is not even a remote possibility for me. Right? That's how important this piece of armor is. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, and then going forward into the battle. You don't go into the battle just running out. You know, It's kind of like a double protection, isn't it? I have the breastplate of righteousness, I've got the girdle of truth, I've got my feet shod with the preparation that I'm at peace with God, and then I've got the shield. It's like double protection. That's, that's the grace of God, isn't it? He loves His kids. He loves His leaders. He loves His people. He protects them. Or at least He makes the provision for their protection. And it may be through life or death, But as we walk by faith, we know that we're walking with the One who assures us of our eternal good. Satan's arrows just keep on coming. 
You know, either I have my shield up and they're being extinguished, or it's down and they're finding their mark and setting my life on fire, not in a good way, but in a destructive, degrading, degenerating way. You see, the war has already been won, but I can be losing the daily battle day after day after day, moment after moment after moment. I can just be getting beat up, shot up, destroyed and yet still belong to the Lord. You know, it says in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, through sin. And when I have my shield down, I'm vulnerable to Satan's darts, which are always sin. He's always shooting them at me and, and finding their mark when I've got my shield down. If I have my shield up, I extinguish how many? All the flaming missiles of the evil one. Nothing can touch me as I walk by faith, not even that scene I described in northeastern Nigeria. Because if God allows my life to end, I just go to heaven. <laughs> you know, that is such an amazing thing. Isn't it? You know, we're so strapped to this world. I mean, if the thought of dying scares you, if it's, if it's a fearful thing to you, then re examine your faith. Re-examine what it is that God has promised to you. And then live this life by faith in the One who gave you life and the life that He gave you in the Scriptures. Without fear. We don't need to live in fear. Perfect love casts out fear, 1 John 5 says. So don't let Satan get the upper hand. Get your shield up. Satan's arrows just keep on coming. Neither I have my shield up or I've got it down and I'm vulnerable. Now, what are some of those arrows he tries to bullseye into my flesh? It's an interesting thing to consider, isn't it? What are some of those arrows? You know, Galatians 5, 19-21 talks about the deeds of the flesh. And I believe... You could, another word of it would be the arrows of Satan that are aimed right at your heart. What are they? Well, they're sexual sin, immorality, impurity, sensuality. How many Christians do you know have been taken out by that? Well, how can it be wrong if it feels so good? Why did God invent sex? You know, why does He make this person available to me if, if He doesn't want me to you know, do it? God invented sex for marriage between a man and a woman, period. And that's it. And, you know, we have often failed in those regards and, and, uh, you know, God's grace is sufficient and wonderful and that, but if at the beginning we just say, no, I'm going to keep my shield up. Not going to give in. And then he mentions uh, idolatry, the worship of this world, uh, the worship of materialism, and so on and so forth. And sorcery, the word pharmakeia means drugs, to, to be in, literally meant to be enchanted by drugs. You know, booze, alcohol, uh, uh, whatever other drug you can get a hold of. You know, prescription drugs are the biggest problem there is today. You know, he says, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. You know, how many, how many Christians' lives have been destroyed by bitterness? Unbelievable. You know, you could go out in this community and if you could get all the bitter Christians who will not set foot inside a church who claim to be Christians, who can't stand their brothers and sisters in Christ or the pastors or the church, you'd have a massive church that would dwarf anything up here. And I would say that would be true in every city that you even consider. You know, how many, how many lives have been destroyed by bitterness and dissension and faction disputes and... Then he says envying and drunkenness and carousings, you know, social type sins. And then he says, and things like this, these. This is not even a complete list. You see, those are some of his arrows that are aimed at you and me. I think of Philippians 3.19. You know, he talks about those whose God is their appetite, who glory in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. You know, that can be us, can it? We can... Be driven by our appetites. Whatever it might be. It might be for food. It might be for drink. It might be for 
perversion, sexual pleasure, pornography, what, you know, whatever the appetite is. It can overtake your life if you let down your shield. We can glory in the shame of this world. We can set our minds on earthly things. You know, 2 Timothy 3, uh, it's kind of like Romans chapter 1, but in 2 Timothy 3, it talks about those who are lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, you know, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. It says, and they're supposedly believers holding to a form of religion, although they've denied its power, it says. Interesting thought. You know, in Romans 1, you know, where it talks about God giving a society over to Satan's flaming missiles. You know, he's just constantly just pulling them out of the quiver and bam, 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 bam. And just constantly firing them in our society too. And that's how we get caught up in it. It's like the, what's going on today? What's the new trend? What's the deal? You know, what, what can I get involved in now? How do I have to be cool? All those kind of things. And, and it says in uh, verse 24, he says, uh, Therefore God gave them over to impurity, to the lusts of their hearts and minds. Sexual sin. And then two verses later, it says, And God gave them over to degrading passions. Homosexuality and lesbianism. Where are we at in our society today? And then it says in two verses later that God gives them over to a depraved mind. And in Greek, that just means a mind that can't think right anymore. And today we have five men making decisions for an entire nation. And they're legalized, well, they've legalized murder in 1973. They legalized, they destroyed the DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. Last year, this year, they legalized, institutionalized homosexuality. Where are we as a nation in that process? We're at the end, folks. Not only do we know those who practice such things are worthy of death, but we give hearty approval now to those who practice them. We applaud them. Bruce Jenner... (laughs) ESPN gives him a courage award for becoming a woman. I don't get that. I don't, I, if I was an unbeliever and didn't even know Christ, I wouldn't understand that. And here we are. Yay, Brucey. You know, I mean, that is... Where are we at as a society, folks? You know, we look at the persecution in Nigeria... We're being persecuted every bit as, but in a whole different, strange kind of way to hold fast, to hold firm to our faith in Christ, to hold firm to living what the Word of God would ask us to live. We are definitely, seriously under attack. You see, Satan has a huge arsenal of fiery arrows. Uh, from which to pick, and since the battle is personal, 1 Peter 5, 8, uh, your adversary, the devil, he knows just the fiery dart that will penetrate your life unless your shield is up and your faith is strong. And it's aimed right at you right now. Now add to that all the fiery trials that await us all if we live long enough. <laughs> Root canals and the other thing. You know, illness, tragedies, possible persecution here in America. Persecution is all over the world right now towards Christians especially. Life's disappointments and setbacks, finances, bad church experiences, and bad family relationships. And you realize the possibilities are endless. The arrows are many. And I don't think it's exaggerating to say that during any Christian's lifetime, there are multiple thousands of deadly arrows launched at the Christian warrior by Satan and his hosts, as well as our own demon-energized society. This world is no friend of Christ. It's no friend of Christians. John 15, 18. But God's remedy, God's protection, is the shield of faith with which you are able to extinguish how many? All. Not some, but all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Not one of his arrows can penetrate the person who is living by faith You know, and we've all experienced this. Our faith in Christ is totally sufficient for life. 
In fact, the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 5, 4, that this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? Well, our faith. Our faith in Christ. Not, not just faith in, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, if you want to live a good life, believe in something. That's not the way it is. It's who you believe in and what you believe that counts. You know, who do you believe in? Do you believe in the one who is the one true God, who is the, the Savior of the world? Do you believe in the Word of God, which is the truth of God, or do you just believe in general? That's the point. Faith has a... This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. The Greek word is very interesting. The Greek word pristuo means faith or trust or belief in someone or something. In this case, the one true God. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> it's right toward the end of the Bible. Sort of right before the book of Revelation. Which we may soon see. In the context here, John says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. We talk about being born again, uh, born from above, and, and this is how by believing. Uh, again, the word is pastuo, faith, by putting your faith, by putting your trust, by putting your belief in Jesus Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. Jesus was born into this world for the express purpose of going to the cross to bear our sins, to bear the wrath of the Father towards sin, to be our substitute, as was explained the other day in DVBS. And we have a special love for Him. By this we know that we love the children of God. And here he's talking about uh, fellow believers, when we love God and observe His commandments. You know, I love that. There's literally scores of commandments in the New Testament. We, we think of the Decalogue, the commandments given to Moses. He says, For whatever, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith in God through Christ, our faith in the Word of God, because we follow Christ. He says, who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You see, this presents faith in its fullness. Yes, faith has an object, God. In particular, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the, the Savior of mankind, Messiah. Uh, the Savior from sin, He and He alone is the object of my faith. But faith also demands action based on that belief in that we love God and observe His commandments and love those born of God. You know, Jesus even said in John fourteen fifteen, He says, if you love Me, and He repeats this four times in that passage in John 14, He says, if you love Me, you will keep My commandments. So it's not just, oh, I believe in Jesus and I live any way I want. I've got my fire insurance policy and I just do whatever I want because I'm me. And just love me the way I am. You know, that kind of thing. No, it's, I put my faith in Jesus and then I look into the Word of God and see how He has asked me to live. And then I go after that in His strength and His power because I love Him. I want to keep His commandments. It's not burdensome. And that's what John says here. His commandments are not burdensome. Because I love Him, I want to live my life to honor and glorify Him. It's kind of like if you carry through the army analogy. If you see a movie like with Roman commanders and stuff, and men would rally and fight because they love the commander, not necessarily because they love to fight. <laughs> you know, they love their country. They love their superiors. They want to honor them. They want to, in a, in a sense, glorify them. And the same thing with a Christian soldier. Because he loves Christ, because he loves the Father, he loves the Son, he loves the Holy Spirit, he is willing to give his life unreservedly in the battle. That's what he's bringing across here. And faith brings about that fullness. 
So not only is faith in a person, it demands an action based on a belief in, in that we love God and observe His commandments. The victory over sin and death was won by our Lord Jesus at the cross and the resurrection, but the world, in a practical sense, is overcome when we by faith believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God and believing we put our faith in Him into practice by keeping His Word, thereby demonstrating our love for Him. That would be a true picture of faith. Faith is therefore in a person, the Lord Jesus, and faith is demonstrative as we live it out, live out His Word in a hostile world. It's that faith that overcomes the world. You know, our faith is both in God, the God of the Word, and in the Word of God, as they both impact our lives in both time and eternity. You see, faith binds us to a vital, living, deep union with God because faith is not just belief, but is a deep, abiding trust in the person of God and what He has spoken to us. To know Him is to love Him, is to live for Him. We all know what Matthew 7.24 says, right? Jesus is preaching and He says, the one who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, be compared to the man who built his house on the rock and all the, the uh, pressures and problems and persecutions of life came and the house stood, right? In 2 Timothy 3.16, He says all Scripture is inspired by God. God breathed and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. He says that the man of God or woman of God may be equipped, trained for every good work. In other words, the Word of God equips us to live out our faith. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll close with this passage. It's a rather extended portion of Scripture, but Hebrews 11 is just an amazing passage on faith. But in 1036, he's talking to a group of Jews. This is a letter to the Hebrews. We don't actually know who wrote it. I think Paul probably wrote it, but uh, that's up for discussion. But whoever it is says, uh, for you have need of endurance. You know, you need to stick it out. He says, so that when you have done the will of God, when you have actually lived out your faith, he says, <clears throat> you may receive what was promised. And he'll explain that what was promised is eternal life. For yet a very little while He is coming, will come, and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith until that time, right? And he repeats that all over the New Testament. It's a quote from Habakkuk 2.4. It's in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and so on. And it says, And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it's impossible to please God. So if we shrink back from living by faith, from exercising faith, God finds no pleasure in us. He says, but we are not those who shrink back to destruction. That's right, isn't it? Anybody want to shrink back? <laughs> he says, uh, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. There's the key to the preserving of the soul. How do you tell if a person is really a Christian or not? By what they say? I don't think so. I mean, what they say has to be right. You know, it has to be according to the Word of God, but it's more in the demonstration of how they live, isn't it? It's who they say they believe in and what they believe about Him and how they choose to live in accordance with to that sound doctrine. That's how we f can tell whether a person really is walking by faith or not. But it's to the preserving of the soul. In other words, it's going to end right. He says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. He says, By it men of old gained approval. I love that. You know, in uh, 1 Peter, if you look over a couple pages in 1 Peter 1, uh, verses seven and and eight, he said, actually seven through nine. He says, he says that, that the proof of your faith, and here he's talking about Christians who are being martyred. 
They're being pitch poured on him. They're being lit up and they're running through Nero's gardens lighting his parties. They're being hung on nets over wild bulls and so on and so forth. They're being sewn in skins and and wild dogs and wolves being sigged on them. And, And he says, the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable. What do we think is the most important thing in this world? Well, gold. You know, buy gold because if then the economy crashes, you can eat it. You know, buy gold. The only investment that whatever. Uh, No, there's something way more precious. And that's your faith in Christ. He says, even though tested by fire, and these people were really, this was after the burning of Rome and it was blamed on the Christians. He says, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, looking to the future, living in the present, but looking to the future. He says, and though you have not seen Him, faith is a conviction of things not seen. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. In other words, whatever happens in this world, you as a believer who have put your faith in Jesus Christ, who have put your faith in the Word of God, cannot lose. Then he goes on and talks about these men of faith. He says, you know, we understand that that the worlds were created out of nothing. Bara ex nihilo. That's what it says in the Hebrew. Out of nothing, God created the heavens and the earth by His creative power. It didn't evolve over years and years and years. And, and you know, they, they, they can't even describe uh, how the origins, you know, the world did not show up on the back of a crystal because where did the crystal come from? You know, Ben Stein's movie Expelled is hilarious. But anyway, we understand by faith that God created the world. That He's the Creator. He's the sustainer of life. He's the one who created you and me in the image of Himself. That's why human life is so precious. That's why life is so precious. Then he talks about Abel. Offered a better sacrifice than Cain because Cain just did what he wanted. Abel actually did it the way God asked him to do it. And then he talks about, he says, without faith it's impossible to please Him, God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Not only is it wonderful to know God, but as you seek him, there is great reward. Ultimately, heaven. Ultimately, eternal life. Ultimately, the transformation of this dying body into one in conformity with the, the body of Christ's glory, Philippians 3 20 and 21 tells us. And then he says, by faith, Noah. Listen to God, did what God said, and preserved humanity in this world, right? And then he says, by faith Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees and established the nation of Israel. And then he says, by faith Sarah herself, 90 years old, <laughs> believe God. That's why the kid was called Isaac. Laughter. You know, she heard that she was going to have a baby that next year and she started laughing, I would imagine hysterically, <laughs> because it was, it was a joke. Why? Because it was a miracle. She couldn't have a baby at 90. I don't know one woman who has. Anyway, then he says in verse 13, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. Doesn't seem fair, does it? They lived an entire life believing God and trusting God, and they didn't receive the promises. He says, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confess that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. You know, Peter calls us strangers and aliens in 1 Peter 2, right? That's the way we live in this world. We are strangers and aliens. I don't know why we think we're supposed to be so popular. He says, For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they had went out, they could have had opportunity to return. But as it is, They desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and He has prepared a city for them. And He's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem described in Revelation 21 and 22. Then He says, by faith, Abraham offered Isaac, his only son, the son of promise, 
believing that if he offered him up, that God would raise him from the dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. Why? Because God said the older would serve the younger. By faith, Moses was preserved in Egypt. It wasn't just because he was put in a little basket and Pharaoh's daughter found him. God orchestrated the whole thing. By faith, he left Egypt for 40 years to be prepared to be the deliverer from Egypt. By faith, he kept the Passover. That was after the ten plagues. Amazing, amazing things that Moses did. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. You know, the children of Israel were whining and complaining about everything, and Moses finally just said, shut up, basically. (laughs) Be quiet and see the deliverance of your God. He waved his staff over the Red Sea, and the sea parted. Israel passed through, and the army of Egypt was drowned. Then it says, it talks about uh, Joshua. Verse 30, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, and Rahab the harlot. You know, it's interesting. She, She makes it into the Bible all over the place. Amazing woman, even though she was a harlot. She's actually in the lineage of Messiah, if you read Matthew chapter 1. Why? Because Christ came to save sinners. She became a a proselyte Jew and is actually in the Messiah's line. Amazing woman. And he says, what shall we say? Verse 32. For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, being became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, and then he changes the subject. He goes from here, the good stuff, what they did by faith, to how those who lived by faith actually persevered. Then he says, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Why? Because they had heaven in view. Stephen, as he's being stoned, saw the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father to receive him. What was his response? Nail him. No, he said, Father, forgive them. Interesting. How many of us would do that as we're being stoned by our persecutors? You know, and he says, uh, and others experienced mocking, scourging, yes, chains, imprisonments. They were stoned. They were... Son and two, they were tempted, they were put to death. John the Baptist had his head chopped off for uh, confronting adultery of, of Herod. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. And then it says, men of whom the world was not worthy. Hmm. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Because God had provided something better for us, So depart from us, they would not be made perfect. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of what? Faith. It's a powerful message. Powerful message portion of scripture you know we always think that when we go forth by faith everything's you know all the mountains are going to disappear and we'll just have a nice easy road he mentions people here who underwent terrible atrocities and at the same time just trusted god through the whole thing whether it was through life or death and they are the heroes of the faith I hope to God we would be in that lineage to be able to stand firm in our faith no matter what this world throws our way, no matter what Satan comes up with. And he's coming up with a lot these days. You see, that's what it means to walk by faith. That's what it means to have your shield up in the battle. We believe in the eternal Son of God for our eternal salvation and we take action in this life trusting in the eternal Word of God and the God of the Word. And that's how by faith we stand strong in the battle. 
You see, every time we're tempted to sin, we have a choice. Either we can trust God and His Word, or we can believe the liar Satan. It's as simple as that. You know, look no further. When you see one of his darts coming, I hope you have your shield up. Because every one of his darts is a lie. There's nothing... You know, Nick Jagger figured it out, even though I don't think he knows the Lord, but he sang the song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. That's the way this world is. You never meet a happy drunk with one beer. You know, if one's good, you know, you might as well have the 24-pack if it comes in that. You know, one bottle's good, what, what would three do for you? You know, if one doobie is good, uh, how about if I could smoke it all day in Colorado? You know, if, you know, one porno show is good, what if I spent the whole 15 hours a day watching porn on the computer? Satan's addictions are destructive. They destroy people. They literally, he's a murderer and a liar. You know, it's as simple as that. Look no further. Flip Wilson used to say, you know, the devil made me do it, but it's, it's really more like I let the devil do it to me. <laughs> because either you can trust God and His Word or you can trust Satan's lies. You can do like Eve and listen to Satan as he whispers in your ear, yea, has God said, is God's Word really true? Oh, you know, I read somewhere where somebody said, oh, it's not true. I know there's an error in there. And I always ask him, well, where is it? I've studied the Bible for 45 years now and never found one. Where is it? Show me. You know, I'm from Missouri. Show me. You know, does he really require this of you? Oh, does he, does he really require that you're absent and outside of marriage? Does he really require that, that uh, you don't steal and cheat and lie to people? Does he really, I mean, little white lies, I mean, what's wrong with them? You know, what's wrong with cheating on your income tax? That government, man, they're not worth a hoot. And on and on goes the rationalization. But what has God said? What does His Word say? That's the thing that we need to really grapple with. Because every time we, we choose to go against God's Word, we choose to believe one of Satan's darts. You know, you're just better off if you just give in. You know, be tolerant of everything. Don't take a stand. How can it be wrong if it uh, tastes so good or it feels so good or, uh, you know, just deny Jesus this once? Why did God create this stuff if He didn't want us to indulge in it? You know? Why? Why does He set the table? Why does He allow that table of temptation to be set before me? You see, Satan is a ruthless enemy and he's a ruthless liar and he would just Love for you to lower your shield so you can put a dart right through your neck. Totally disable you. Nothing he says and nothing he does is for your benefit, but ultimately for your destruction. He's constantly got his fiery missiles aimed and ready to just and just waiting for the person who will lower his shield. Or better yet, the one who will uh, just run off into the battle without it. But beloved, this is the victory, our faith, in Christ and in His Word. You know, I love Psalms 3.3, and I could have went over 50 verses on this, but it says, You, O Lord, are the shield about me. Psalms 18.2 says, God is my shield, and He is the horn of my salvation. Amazing verses, and there's many others in the Scripture. So, beloved, as you wage this life and death struggle, take up the shield of faith with which you're able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, may God etch those words in our hearts and minds as we walk by faith in this fallen world. You know, stand your ground like that soldier. Have that shield planted in the ground and you behind it, and let the shield of faith absorb the flaming missiles of the evil one, and then go about the Lord's work in the Lord's way, according to the Lord's Word. Let's pray.